had to come out and take a quick Instagram pic of the joy of snow out here in the snow. Although ironically this book is actually not really about snow a whole lot. It's Elizabeth Googe's autobiography which has been so fun and so fascinating to read because I love her book so much so it's so cool to see what incidents in her life inspired different scenes, different settings. Elizabeth Googe is such a good author for appreciating like the little things. So that's where the title of this book comes from. She knows how to appreciate the simple joy of the snow. See, I thought I would take advantage of the fact it has it has a plastic uh, dust plastic covering on the dust jacket. I think I got the shot. See, look at this, back inside, and the book is none the worse for wear. I was only in the snow for a couple of seconds, so <laughs> I just brushed it off, and it's all nice. Now I can enjoy it inside with a nice cup of coffee. My um, cousin Becky found me these, so I just added some salted caramel. Isn't that fun, though? So it's like a mini Starbucks syrup, so you can have flavored coffee at home. I really like my desk setup at the moment. I've got all these cute little ceramic um, containers that my brother... Uh, Porthos got me. These are my grandmother's knitting needles, so I thought this would be a fun way to display them. Yes, I'm probably halfway through The Joy of the Snow. It's actually been taking me a while to get through this because I feel like um, it doesn't really have a plot. And she does kind of go into these different digressions, which are interesting, but like you kind of lose the impetus to keep reading. There's Elizabeth Googe when she was little. Um, but so many, as usual with Elizabeth Googe, so many beautiful reflections, so many interesting things to hear about when they lived. I just have gotten to the Oxford chapters and they sound lovely. So fun to hear about when they lived at Ely and to hear about her uh, family that lived on the Guernsey Islands. So that's kind of the uh, inspiration for uh, Green Dolphin Street where they live on the beautiful island of St. Pierre. Look at this. There was a lot of gladness in the clothes of that period. They swished and rustled and floated and swept and chains and bracelets tinkled. Elizabeth Gooch's mother was unfortunately uh, ill for much of her life, but I love this passage about her. She was never so ill that she could not make other people laugh and was far too good a fighter to be resigned to anything whatever that she disliked. I've just been enjoying a cozy evening with Jane Austen. I've been rereading Northanger Abbey. I've had this on my pile of books to read for the past couple of months now, but somehow I always ended up picking something else up, but now I'm I'm quite always into it. It's just such a delightful story. I love Catherine so much, and it's like so funny, like the kind of misunderstandings at the beginning because um, you know, she meets Mr. Tilney at like, I think one of her very first balls in Bath. Um, but then she becomes friends with the Thorps and her brother arrives, so she's very much engaged with them. And the Thorps kind of trick her into going on a uh, ride with them when she had been supposed to meet the Tilneys. And then of course she's annoyed, but she's so sweet the way she like apologizes to Mr. Tilney. I love how Jane describes it. If Mr. Thorpe would only have stopped, I would have jumped out and run after you. Is there a Henry in the world who could be insensible to such a declaration? Henry Tilney at least was not. And then when the Thorps try to trick her a second time into kind of sliding the Tilneys and going with them, she says, it does not signify talking. If I could not be persuaded into doing what I thought wrong, I never will be tricked into it. So many fun characters. I love Mr. and Mrs. Allen are so great. And the general, general Tilney, I like this. The general attended her himself to the street door, saying everything gallant as they went downstairs, admiring the elasticity of her walk and then down here Catherine delighted by all that had passed proceeded gaily to Pult Pultney Street I think that's how you pronounce that walking as she concluded with great elasticity though she had never thought of it before I love that I think we should all walk with greater elasticity and of course that uh, of course my thing or Abby is also a satire on other uh, kind of novels and romances of the period so there are so many like really funny sarcastic things which I think are still funny even though you know the kind of um, books that she was kind of satirizing aren't 
popular today. Like, you still, you still get where she's coming from. I, I love this passage. The Tilney's called for her at the appointed time, and no new difficulty arising, no sudden recollection, no unexpected summons, no impertinent intrusion to disconcert their measures. My heroine was most unnaturally able to fulfill her engagement, though it was made with the hero himself. I just love Jane Austen's language. Like, it's so effortless, and yet she uses such great words, such great turns of phrase, but it feels, at least to me, very natural. It just kind of rolls off the tongue, and I find myself, whenever I reread these uh, novels, just rereading them so quickly because they're just so, so fun and so lovely, and like the dialogue especially just like kind of leads itself on so in such a great way. I still have not yet read The Mysteries of Udolpho, or in fact anything by Anne Radcliffe, I've read a lot of Jane Austen's other contemporaries like Fanny Burney and uh, some of the books mentioned in here, Cecilia uh, and Camilla and Belinda. That's Mariah Edgeworth. Mariah Edgeworth is so good. How do you like my Instagram layout? I find it impossible to take good pictures of a Kindle. So this, this isn't too bad. I feel like this is the first time I've ever managed to have a little Kindle layout that I liked. Here are my Mrs. Tim books. I've been reading them on my Kindle. I am now on Mrs. Tim Flies Home, which is the final book in the series. The covers are really sweet. Isn't that a pretty illustration? Kindle books do not have a great Instagram aesthetic, but they are pretty handy. I have been kind of racing through these uh, Mrs. Tim books just because they're so enjoyable and so lovely. There's a uh, D.E. Stevenson read-along on Instagram. Um, so that was what inspired me to pick up Mrs. Tim. And this is the first time I had ever read them. I read so many D.E. Stevenson books, but I had somehow never encountered the Mrs. Tim books. It starts with Mrs. Tim of the Regiment, which comes, which is right before World War II, and then we kind of go into World War II, which is Mrs. Tim Carries On. I also read Bell Lamington and Fletcher's End, which I loved. But anyway, then comes Mrs. Tim Gets a Job, so that's right after the war, and then Mrs. Tim Flies Home is the last one. I wish there were more, because they're so delightful. The Mrs. Tim books do remind me quite a bit of the Diary of a Provincial Lady series by E.M. Delafield, which I also absolutely love. It's the same kind of slice of life, like very witty, very funny. I think that uh, The Provincial Lady is a little bit like even more sarcastic and like just really sharp with her wit. Um, but Mrs. Tim has a little bit more story. There's a little bit more of a plot or even like sort of mini plot arcs. Like in the first one, first we hear when Mrs. Tim is with the regiment, so her husband is a captain in the uh, army. Which, which one is it? Infantry, I'm pretty sure. So we hear about life in the regiment, but then uh, her husband Tim gets transferred to um, a town in Scotland, so we hear about that, and then she ends up going on vacation up in the Highlands, and it's so beautiful, and that's like a whole nother little world. Apparently, they are based on D.E. Stevenson's own diaries, or at least the first one is kind of based on the diary, because her husband was in the military, and she kept a diary, and she shared it with some friends, and they thought it was so great. They encouraged her to, you know, work it into a story and publish it. I kind of wonder if there is a real life uh, Tony. Tony Morley is uh, quite the character. I felt so bad for him in the first couple because he is kind of in love with uh, Hester, Mrs. Tim, but she like doesn't even see it. There are so many little things in the books that like you see pretty quickly, but Hester doesn't see or doesn't figure out at all till later. But in the later books, I don't know, I felt better about Tony because obviously his friendship with both Tim and Hester um, is such a great friendship and I think brings a lot into his life. And of course it's kind of fun that he's rich and he shows up in his Bentley and he can kind of make problems go away just like that. I've now finished my tea so I can tell you about some of my favorite quotes. The character Hester is flying back to England from Egypt where her husband has been stationed and she's in Rome and so she meets this American and the American is telling her all these sights she can see and then she meets Tony who's showing around and I like this. I, I tell him about the American girl and he says he's quite willing to show me Rome but it will take a couple of years. At least two years, says Tony thoughtfully. Of course I'm on for it if you are, but I thought you were supposed to be resting here like a homing pigeon and continuing your flight tomorrow. Now I want to go to Rome. I have not yet picked out a quote to use as a caption of my Instagram post. One of the nice things about Kindle is that it's so easy to make a note of all of your favorite quotes. I'm struck by the ability of these people to talk nonsense incessantly. That's when she's visiting uh, charters. Charters, towers, the sun is shining and everything looks and very, feels very Sundayish. Today is Sunday. Maybe I should use that one. I like this one as well. This is an unpleasant thought and I decided to drown it in tea. <laughs> There were so many beautiful reflections when she was visiting um, the Highlands. My thoughts drift across the garden and hang upon the trees like fairy lights, or curl upwards and vanish like the smoke of a Burnside, of Burnside chimney. 
I can take a thought from the cupboard of my memory just as I take a dress from my wardrobe, give it a little shake, and put it on or fold it away. I like this. Somewhere in the world there must be a formula. Am I trembling upon the edge of it now? Which, could I but grasp it, would reveal to me the secret of the universe? For there must be a secret, of course. The world would never roll over and over on its way through time and space as every if everyone's thoughts were as vagrant and purposeless as mine. This secret, once known, would string my thoughts together like a necklace of pearls. I just love that. Another thing I love about the Mrs. Tim books is how they're full of all these random little references to things that you don't even get because they're not things from this, you know, this decade, this century. They're like little things that people in her time would have known and recognized. My mom is reading this as well and so she's been stopping to look some of them up and she looked up this poem that at one point um, Hester mentions that's about, here we go, I just looked it up. It's a poem by Francis Darwin Cornford. I have no idea how this poem became a thing. It's to a lady seen from the train. Oh, why do you walk through the fields in gloves, missing so much and so much? Oh, fat white woman whom nobody loves, why do you walk through the field in gloves? I, they only mentioned the poem in passing in the book, but my mom was curious about it, and when she looked it up, she found an answer to the poem, because it's not a very nice poem, like, fat white woman, like, why, why are you judging her? So this, The Fat White Woman Speaks, is a poem by G.K. Chesterton. It's essentially written to the poet who wrote the original poem. Why do you rush through the field in trains, guessing so much and so much? Why do you flash through the flowery meads, fathead poet that nobody reads? And why do you know such a frightful lot about people in gloves as such? And how the devil can you be so sure, guessing so much and so much? How do you know but what someone who loves always to see me in nice white gloves at the end of the field you are rushing by is waiting for his old Dutch? <laughs> Isn't that fantastic? It is so fascinating to think about like all the little things that people of the past, like little references and little inside jokes that they would have known and, and like would have been in the news and in sort of common parlance that have kind of been lost. Like you only come across them in books like Mrs. Tim where they mention them in passing. And I'm sure the things of today that we all know and hear about like in a hundred years and even 50 years, people will be like, what's that? I've never heard of that. So yes, Mrs. Tim has just been so delightful as a little slice of life. And I've read so much D.E. Stevenson. I love the Miss Bunkle books. I've read many of her books, but I'd never come across the Mrs. Tim series before, so I'm so glad I've read it. This, by the way, is a Kath Kidston design. They recently had a, a, a Bambi uh, collection that came out, and it's so cute. This morning with my cup of tea, I'm going to continue on with Four Years in Paradise. I showed this book on my Insta story. I can't remember if I've shared it um, in one of the vlogs yet. The uh, Martin and Osa Johnson Museum, Safari Museum in Chinook, Kansas was kind enough to send this to me. I posted about reading this book. I Married Adventure um, back in the fall and the curator of the museum reached out and just said they appreciated my post. But yeah, I had mentioned wanting to read Four Years in Paradise so they said, hey, would you like a copy? And I was like, oh my gosh, yes please. Apparently, they also have copies of this on hand to send to cast members at the Animal Kingdom Lodge. Definitely gonna bring this or possibly the zebra striped edition on my next trip to the Animal Kingdom Lodge because this would be the perfect thing to read in the Sunset Lounge. They actually just came out with a new paperback of I Married Adventure. It has a picture of Martin and Osa on the front and the zebra stripes. I'll have to put a picture of the cover right here. I kind of wonder if they're going to sell it at the Animal Kingdom Lodge in Zawadi uh, in the gift shop. They totally should because then you could buy it right there. The museum also sent me I Cooked Adventure, Global Recipes from Kansas to Kenya by Osa Johnson, which in Four Years in Paradise, Osa talks about how two of her favorite things were fishing and cooking. There was a whole chapter about like her different fishing experiences. She was describing this beautiful hotel. Oh, I can't remember the name of it now. It was Blue Mists, I 
feel like the word blue was in it but apparently it was near a waterfall and there were all of these little huts each one with a number and because of the waterfall the hotel uh, managers had installed electricity which there wasn't a whole lot of electricity um, most of the places where Osa and Martin went she says and Osa says she got up super early in the morning and went out to the waterfall to go fishing I think I've only been fishing once so I'm admittedly not a big angler but just the whole description of that sounded so charming I'm sure there are lots of fish recipes in here let's see fishing in the South Seas. Look at that, so many photos, so cool. Coconut pineapple cake, oh my goodness. Coconut fish bake, cooking in clay, corn custard. Yeah, I'm gonna have to decide which one of these two, um, you and Rose, oh my goodness. I'm gonna have to decide which one of these recipes to try. Wow, floating island pudding, that sounds kinda good. In the film Babuna, Martin says that the snows of Mount Kilimanjaro reminded, of, reminded him of devil's food cake. See, these are my kind of people, Martin and Oza. Reading um, Four Years in Paradise. Oh, by the way, did I show you my scarf? I finished it. Look at these little baubles. I'm kind of proud of myself for having achieved those baubles so well. Anyway, sorry, I'm getting distracted. It's so cool to hear about Osa and Martin's kind of ingenuity. Apparently one of their trucks, they built like a little flap on the top so that Martin could just pop up and take a picture like if they were passing some beautiful animals and then, hold on, where's the other? So they moved to this uh, remote lake in Africa and they stayed there four years and they built all these huts. It's so cool. All these amazing pictures of elephants. Hold on, where's the thing? Giraffes. Oh, where's the picture I was looking for? Here it is, look at this. It's a treetop blind, so they didn't want the animals to know they were there. So they built this little hut way up in the tree and like, that just sounds exactly like something my mom would do. Like, she, I need to get a picture, so let's just build this little hut up in the tree and then we'll be able to get the perfect picture. It's just so inspiring the way, you know, Martin and Osa didn't just talk about their dreams. Like, they went out and did them. I Married Adventure, um, the first book that I read, was more of like an overview of kind of all of their lives together and all of their different adventures. But Four Years in Paradise is basically just about one trip, or obviously a four year long trip, where they went to Africa and, and lived by Lake Paradise. I liked both books, but I feel like this book goes a little bit more in depth of like kind of step by step because the other book obviously was covering a big range of different experiences and different trips, whereas this one is kind of going in depth into one one trip. There are some poppies growing in the desert. So I recently finished these two. The Seahawk I got before Christmas and it somehow just took me forever to open it up and read it, but I have enjoyed it. I think I liked... Um, Captain Blood and, oh they don't have Scaramouche on the back here, but I think I like Sca Captain Blood and Scaramouche a little bit better. It's funny how Raphael Sabatini, I feel like his main characters, they make great pirates, but they're like unintentional pirates. Like they didn't mean to become pirates, it's always some sort of outside force that draws them to it. Here's the blurb on the back. Oliver Tresalian, a Cornish gentleman, is blessed with youth, wealth, and good digestion. He is betrayed and becomes a renegade and Barbary Corsair. It's definitely very thrilling, very dramatic, sort of like uh, Sir Walter Scott, uh, Sir Oliver, the main character, uh, the Seahawk, is actually friends with Queen Elizabeth. He gets sent to the galleys, which definitely gives you some um, Ben-Hur vibes. Sometimes I think things we complain about, I complain about too, are like so small and unimportant. And when you look, read about you know, the Seahawk getting sent to the galleys and being betrayed. It's like, you know what? I can probably handle whatever challenge it is that's bugging me and getting me down. I also finished Elizabeth Googe's The Joy of the Snow, which I did enjoy. I like her fiction a lot better, and in some ways I feel like you can get a better sense of who she is from her fiction. But the last chapter was one of my favorites, though. I believe that we are created by love, and that sooner or later the persuasion of love will draw us up out of our darkness to stand in its exquisite light and see ourselves at last as we really are. The picture I see is of a deep seed in the earth. Somewhere, far up above the weight of darkness pressing upon the pitiful little seed, is the drawing and the calling of the sun. It seems an impossible journey towards something that has never been seen and cannot be known, but half unconsciously the blind seed puts out roots to steady itself, pushes an imploring hand upwards and starts the struggle. She also compares it to like a small animal burrowing up out of the darkness trying to find the sun. But meanwhile, what is he? There is no judgment seat, for the sun does not judge him, merely warms him and gives him light. He is his own judge, and strengthened by the warmth, he looks at himself in the light. What has he made of himself in the dark tunnel? What is he like? A dirty little animal, a shaky bit of stalk holding up a crumpled bud that has no beauty in it. 
The knowledge is agony, for with blind eyes down in the dark he had thought a good deal of himself, and the agony is both his judgment and his inspiration. He cannot stand in the light like this. The paws go out in supplication. The petals push away the calyx and take on the shape of praying hands. Do what you like with me, whatever the cost. Wash me and make me clean that I may be with you. So if you've read a bunch of her other fiction and have enjoyed it, then I would recommend this because it is fun to get to know her a little bit better and to hear about the things that inspired some of the books or, or when she wrote some of the books. It was really interesting. She described writing um, The Child from the Sea, which is a book that I've read that is set in... Here it is, right next to Salman Khan and Osa Johnson. <laughs> Um, it, this is the weirdest cover because that girl looks so modern. This is set in like the time of Charles the first and like uh, Oliver Cromwell. Charles the second. So this is about um, Lucy Walter who the secret wife of King Charles the second. It is very thick um, and it was very difficult to get through but at the same time it was just so beautiful. There were so many things that were just so worth it that like were worth the kind of slog. I felt a little bit the same way about do I have it here? I think I might have put it on another shelf. Um, the Green Dolphin Street. Uh, Green Dolphin Street was also a very long book. Anyway, Elizabeth Googe talks about both Green Dolphin Street and um, The Child from the Sea. Here it is. That book, The Child from the Sea, like Green Dolphin Street, took years to write and was beset by so many total interruptions that it too became too long. I doubt if it is a good book. Nevertheless, I love it because its theme is forgiveness. And also because I seem to give to it all I have to give. Very little heaven knows. So yes, I'm definitely glad I finished this and glad I have it on my shelf. One thing I didn't know about um, Elizabeth Googe is that she was a fan of Tolkien. Here's some Tolkien right here. In fact, one of her little dogs she named Froda after Frodo. Where is Froda? One of those dogs in there. Yes, if you watched my Christmas vlog, you'll remember I had a um, Bon Maman uh, jam advent calendar, which I finished almost all the jams, but the jars are so cute. I've washed them all, and I like wanna, and I need to think of some kind of cute little craft to do with them. I just haven't thought of the perfect craft yet. So if you guys have any ideas, definitely let me know. <laughs> Since I've been finishing up some books, I need to find a new one to start. I haven't, I think I've read Treasure Island once before, but I haven't broken in this copy yet. I found this at Sheaf Street Books in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. My cousin Becky and I went on a fun uh, trip to New England, and I just couldn't resist it. It was like $3. I often throw my latest crafting projects into my reading blogs, so I figured I would show you guys. I got a new wreath from Paper Source. These are so pretty. They're paper flower wreaths. So I'm in the process. I have to punch out the flowers. I have started. Uh, you have to kind of curl them. I think there's like an actual like crafting thing you can buy, but I just use a, a small pencil <laughs> to curl in the edges. And I think it's gonna be so pretty when it's done. It's a lot like that wreath right there is also a lovely paper, uh, paper source, paper flower wreath. And then I have in my knitting bag here, my cousin Becky made me this, isn't it so pretty? I love the different color on the strap. I think this is going to be such a pretty scarf. It's another um, pattern that I got from uh, yarn.com, so webs. My cousin Becky and I stopped at their uh, warehouse in near Emily Dickinson's house in Amherst, Massachusetts. Look at how pretty that is. So this is like a kind of lace um, edge, and then this is what it's gonna look like in the end. I think it's so pretty. I just love these colors. Here are the other two colors for the uh, for the scarf. And I love the names. This one is Coral Rose. This one is Mango Ice. And this one was, I think, Beach House, which is so perfect. This scarf here that I was uh, showing earlier is also a kit from Webs. I still need to block it. Um, I think it'll lie more nicely because I think it's supposed to be more of a straight angle. But I had trouble. These were kind of hard to do, at least. Like, I feel like my gauge was very uh, tight, whereas for this, we're a little bit easier, so I was a little bit looser. But hopefully blocking will fix that. I can't remember now if I showed this when it was in progress or not. But anyway, here's the finished, uh, finished product. Comes all the way, tapers to the end there. I'd never done anything more complicated than knit and purl. So I was pretty proud of myself for getting this done. So friends, it's been a little while since I last filmed a new um, segment of my bookish vlog. It's now March, which I'm pretty sure I started this in January. So this is gonna be a sort of first, uh, third, first, uh, 
first quarter of the year uh, vlog, but I have some books that I just finished that I thought I'd fill you in on, and a couple that I'm planning to start. So this book I mentioned back, oh I ripped off the, that got ripped off somehow. Um, I mentioned this back in my Christmas vlog because I started this a really long time ago. It's kind of, I found it to be slow going because it's a little bit depressing. Um, so like I'd read a couple chapters and I would just feel really sort of down about everything in the age we live in and I'd be like maybe I'll read something more cheerful. Um, I do think it was an important book though and I basically agree with all the points he's making. Uh, it's called The Benedict Option, A Strategy for Christians in a Post-Christian Nation by, Bro by Rod Dreher. One of the things that I liked best about this book was um, how many different sources he draws from and how many different um, authors and great writers and thinkers and theologians from, you know, age from the present but then also from ages past he draws on because the title is inspired by St. Benedict who wrote this rule of living that was used in monasteries in the Dark Ages and the Middle Ages um, where these really close-knit you know, Christian communities came together and worked together and lived together and supported each other. And his point is that, you know, our culture can often be hostile towards uh, those who are religious or spiritual. So basically, we're going to need to stand independently of the culture if we want to, if we value our religion. Although, like, to a certain extent, it's kind of like, I feel like that's true in every age. Like, you never want your actions to be dictated by the culture and society around you. You always want to be in control of the choices you're making and the way you're living your life. You always want to be thoughtful about it. So from that perspective, it's kind of just common sense. Um, but I did like the way he put things and, and the way he talked about things for the most part. It was definitely a, a thought-provoking read. I also finished, I bought this a while ago, it's the pretty um, Penguin English Library paperback of the, Scar of the Scarlet Pimpernel by Baroness Orzy. It's a pretty interesting spelling right there. It's such a pretty cover, isn't it? Um, this is an old favorite of mine. I've read it before. Um, I hadn't reread it in a little while, and it was really enjoyable coming back to it and all the characters. I don't think I've seen... There's a movie adaptation. It might be in black and white, but it looks kind of cool, and I've always been meaning to watch it, and I haven't yet. This is a great adventure story. Um, it's set at the time of the French Revolution, and there is a daring Englishman called the Scarlet Pimpernel. No one knows exactly who he is, um, but he basically sneaks over to France and helps uh, families of aristocrats escape from the gu guillotine, because, of course, at that time in France, they were just wholesale executing. And you meet Marguerite, who I absolutely love. Marguerite. Blakeney, uh, Lady Blakeney. I like the kind of courtly manners and, and bows and balls that they go to. I would highly recommend this. I was realizing though, sometimes when you reread something, like since you know the plot, you're not as caught up in it, so you kind of notice like maybe some weaknesses uh, to it more than you would otherwise, but I was realizing that especially towards maybe the latter third or so of the book, like it gets a little bit too repetitive like I felt like there were some like thoughts and emotions that the author dwells on too much like because they could have used that space to talk more about the characters and the history because it's such a cool like the way all the characters are woven together um, and the way it all unfolds is really cool but you never really get to know the Scarlet Pimpernel like I wish you got to know even more about his backstory what motivated him to kind of take on these daring rescues it's like kind of hinted at his motivations but I think it would have been really interesting to explore it more in fact I feel like this book could could be even longer because like the setup is so exciting that it would be fun to hear more about the adventures like I, I wanted more I have a vague recollection of reading either I feel like it wasn't a whole sequel like a whole second book but maybe like a short story I'm gonna have to look this up and see if there are any subsequent um, books or stories because I know another book I love uh, kept in blood by Raphael Sabatini I've been reading The Seahawk uh, by that same author earlier, uh, but um, that book, the, the the Captain Blood, has several sequels, which are super exciting, and I don't know if I'm getting this mixed up with that, or if I'm just making it up, it would be great to have a sequel to The Scarlet Pimpernel. I would love to hear more about these characters. I am very, very nearly finished with Four Years in Paradise by Osa Johnson. I am like 
this this much. This is this is how much I have left to go. I've been enjoying it so much. I just think this is absolutely fascinating. She really brings you into what it was like living at Lake Paradise when they go out on safari and all the challenges of trying to like get a good picture. Which I mean, I obviously don't go to Africa in this in this time period too. It was from 1924 to 1927. Um, but but even like in my little travel vlogs like I know the pain of missing a good shot like you know when I'm at Disney or when I'm traveling and it's like I didn't have the camera out quite quick enough but for them it must have been so much harder to get a good shot because the equipment like you didn't just whip your camera out like you know whip your GoPro out like you had to set it all up and it was very you know heavy and you know a whole big apparatus in fact on this trip I don't think they even traveled by plane later they did travel by plane but at first you know they're traveling by foot traveling with their cars and and trucks yeah so 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 it's fun to hear her describing all these beautiful things that they saw and they like almost got the shot or they wished they had a camera with them and it was like oh just so close just missed it I'm actually I'm actually a little tiny bit annoyed with myself that I didn't like save this to read at the Animal Kingdom Lodge but I'm sure I will enjoy rereading it or rereading I Married Adventure and I think I know at least uh, Martin Johnson wrote more different books, um, so definitely going to have to look into those. I haven't even seen the actual movies, because of course um, there are tons of photographs in here, which is so fantastic, of like their home at Lake Paradise and different photos they captured. There's Osa. Oh, hold on. Can you see it? There's Osa in front of her home. There's a cool shot of a lion. The photos are just absolutely beautiful. I, Osa would take some, but Martin Johnson was kind of the, the primary photographer, but he obviously had an amazing eye because they're just so beautifully composed. Look at that shot. What a, That's a lucky shot, the composition. Oh my gosh. It wasn't as simple as just going and riding Kilimanjaro Safari for them. They actually had to take these long, long treks out. But anyway, I they also did uh, motion pictures and I have not yet seen their motion pictures, although I did watch this really cool documentary that um, the, uh, I, I already mentioned that the, the Safari Museum sent me this book, um, and uh, they also sent me a link to this cool documentary um, about Martin and Osa, which was absolutely fascinating. So that did have like some clips of their work, but I wanna, I wanna just go back and watch like the movie that came out when they went to Lake Paradise. Like Martin and Osa Johnson are so cool, they need to be like better known. And then some other things I picked up from my shelves that I either haven't read or haven't read completely. Um, I found this at uh, Barnes & Noble. It's the Bronte Sisters three novels. So it has Jane Eyre, Wuthering Heights, and Agnes Grey. Agnes Grey is by Anne Bronte. I've not read it before. I did start it once. Um, I don't know. The Brontes, I mean, they're wonderful. I do enjoy their novels when I read them, but... I don't really get into them. I don't know, they don't feel like real friends the way like Jane Austen feels like a real friend. And I feel the same way about Charles Dickens. I just, I, I like Charles Dickens. And when I start reading him, I absolutely admire him. But um, I don't know, he's just not one of my favorites. I bought this at Barnes & Noble as well a while ago. It's Three Novels of New York by Edith Wharton. The only one I read was Custom of the Country, which I actually didn't like very much. It was super depressing. Although I know Edith Wharton can be kind of depressing, which is funny because I've read a bunch of her letters and they're actually very uplifting, like very beautiful. But I don't think I've ever read The House of Mirth or The Age of Innocence, and I, I, and I should definitely break in this copy some more. It has these fabulous gossiping ladies of New York. Do you guys like my authors on the wall back there? This is from a Ladies of Literature uh, calendar by Idlewild that I had a couple years ago. I love it when I can reuse a calendar after the calendar year is over and put them up as posters on my wall. So I couldn't decide whether to start with House of Mirth or Age of Innocence, so I decided to ask you guys. We'll see how the poll goes. Don't you love it when you have a steaming hot beverage and you can watch the steam float off of it. It's just so cozy. On a cold winter's day, there's been lots of snow. I've been doing lots of shoveling. So I definitely feel like I've earned my coffee. I'm not doing any reading at the moment. I'm working on my video. This is for six years on YouTube. I wrote you guys all a letter and I hope you enjoy it. Well, friends, I am finally finishing off this video. I feel like that quote from Elizabeth Gooch that I read earlier, like, this video, this reading vlog has just gone on for far too long to be any good. But sometimes long chatty vlogs can be fun, so hopefully you guys will enjoy. I did want to let you know that, that The Age of Innocence won out over House of Mirth in my Instagram poll, and I did start it, and I've been enjoying it, but I'll fill you in on that more in the next reading vlog. I did post my letter to my subscribers on my channel's sixth anniversary, and you guys were so incredible 
unbelievably kind each and every comment on that video oh my gosh just I feel so encouraged and so inspired and so grateful to have such an absolutely amazing group of subscribers so thank you so much to everyone who left a comment on that I did try to reply to them the first um, night it went up but I have to go back try to reply to some more as always thank you guys so much for watching I hope you have a magical day stay bookish bye guys